Basil II ruled the Byzantine world for half a century. Over the course of his long reign, he was responsible for many successful undertakings, both foreign and domestic. It should come as no surprise, however, that the man immortalized by later generations as the Bulgar Slayer spent most of his time and energy fighting a resurgent Bulgarian empire under the dynamic leadership of Samuel Kamitopoulos. Basil's former imperial colleague, John I Zemiskis, had absorbed Bulgaria, but taking advantage of Byzantine preoccupation in the wake of Zemiskis' death in early 976, Samuel had reclaimed a good deal of territory. Soon after dismissing his relative and political handler, Basil Lacopinus, a young Basil II had tried his hand at suppressing the rebellion, only to be smashed and humiliated at Trajan's Gate, a disaster which inspired Basil's eastern generals to revolt. Having dealt with Bardas Scleris and Bardas Phocas by 989, the heir to the Macedonian dynasty was determined to reacquire all of Bulgaria for the empire. Our story today begins in 989, as Basil returns to the west to square off with the man destined to be his great rival for the next quarter century. Both rulers are strategically savvy, able to command loyalty, experienced, and at the peak of their mental and physical powers. This will be part three of our series focusing on the Bulgarian War from 991 to 1003. In part four, we will look at the Bulgarian War from 1003 to its climax in 1014. In part five, we will look at the last decade of Basil's life, where he was just as active as ever, wrapping up his conquest of Bulgaria and also engaging in other theaters, this all taking place between 1014 and 1025. So without any further ado, let us begin by looking at the early phases of Basil's Bulgarian War. Although his reign was relatively brief, John I Zemiskis was one of the more capable men to ever sit on the throne of Byzantium. He had all of the skills one would want in an emperor, and he also had a signature achievement, the absorption of Bulgaria. However, this absorption was something of a happenstance. The Rus had deflected from an attack on Byzantium to strike Bulgaria, and they had overrun the country much more easily than anyone could have reasonably anticipated. This required John Zemiskis to intervene on behalf of the Bulgarians in order to prevent a consolidation of a great Rus state. After expelling the Rus, he betrayed the agreement that he had made with the Tsar of Bulgaria and instead absorbed the Bulgarian realm into the Byzantine. At the time, most of the leadership class of Bulgaria had died in the most recent war and Zemiskis had taken the Tsar and his family into captivity, so there was no one to rule the empire. Since Zemiskis was a very charming man who could get along well with all of the leading aristocrats of the Bulgarian empire, at least the ones who were left, they were largely willing to accept the state of affairs as it stood at that moment, although there was a great deal of resentment. Bulgaria had been well established for a long time, the Bulgarians dated back their empire's foundation to 681, and their rulers had taken the title of Tsar around 917 or so. They had been a major power rival to Byzantium for about 100 years, or maybe not quite 100 years, but a pretty decent amount of time. They certainly thought of themselves as having been an equal power to Byzantium, and under the reign of Simeon I, they most certainly were. So the death of Bulgaria was somewhat premature. Most Bulgarians, were, once they recovered from the shock of the Rus invasion, thought that it might be a good idea to revive the old empire, that it had been snuffed out rather than having died naturally or having lost its reason for existence. So some Bulgarian uprising was, I believe, inevitable. And had John Zemiskis lived further on into 976, had his health held up, he would have been much, much better able to handle this crisis than an 18-year-old Basil and his various advisors. When Basil was young, as we know, he was headstrong, arrogant, and still did not have the complete suite of skills one needed to rule. We also have to keep in mind that although we today look at this as John Zemiskis' deed, 
intervening against the Rus and then absorbing Bulgaria. Basil II had technically taken the throne earlier than John Zemisky's, even though he was still a teenager at the time. So in his own mind, and by the logic of the imperial system, especially the system that said that he was a part of the legitimate dynasty, he thought that this was his achievement. This was his doing, the adding of Bulgaria. So although he was a little bit iffy on whether or not Zemisky's had been legitimate, he certainly thought that the acquisition of Bulgaria had been a major coup for the empire and that it was on him and a part of his own legacy to make sure that the empire held on to Bulgaria. On a more personal level, the defeat at Trajan's Gate when he had tried to campaign in Bulgaria in 986 was something which continued to haunt Basil. While I have challenged Pacellus's account of Basil's military approach and his methodology, I do think that Pacellus was right to think that Basil's obsession with details stemmed from what happened at Trajan's Gate, where just a bit more scouting might have uncovered Samuel's ambush and saved Basil from a whole lot of heartache. Remember, it was that defeat at Trajan's Gate which really shook confidence in Basil and enabled Bardas Phocas to attempt a revolt. Bardas Phocas, of course, was the nephew of the late Nicephorus II Phocas. Bulgaria, as I mentioned, had once been a very dangerous major rival to Byzantium, and Basil, by this point, could probably recognize in Samuel, the kind of guy who could found a new dynasty, which could then revive Bulgaria, and you might have a return to the bad old days of Simeon, where Byzantine lands are being plundered on the regular by roving armies. He did not want this to happen. He thought that the best thing for Byzantium in the long term was to destroy Bulgaria once and for all and then absorb all of its strength into the empire to make the empire even better than it had been and more dominant than it had been in the Balkans since the Slavic invasions. Although Basil was chomping at the bit to get back at Bulgaria, he had to deal with affairs in the east first. Not only did he have to defeat the two usurpers, but then he had to deal with a couple of minor players as well. The East was still the empire's primary source of recruits, wealth, and agriculture. So making sure that the East was settled was ultimately the most important thing for any emperor to do at this period. Basil, after meeting with Bardas Sclerus, who supposedly gave him some excellent advice for governing the empire, then had to deal with the recalcitrant ruler of Upper Tau, Devit III. This would have happened in late 988 or early 989. I covered that in the last video. Suffice it to say now that Basil overwhelmed Devit III, who then agreed to make Basil the heir to his kingdom. This was a major achievement, even if it was achieved very quickly. When he returned to Constantinople, Basil began to make preparations for a continuous war against the Bulgarians. He knew that under Samuel's leadership, there's no way that they would buckle the way that they had under the Rus. And so he was prepared to launch campaigns which would last throughout the winter and break the spirit of the Bulgarians. However, his preparations were interrupted in the October of 989, October 25th to be precise, by a massive earthquake which did a great deal of damage to many parts of the city, including cracking the dome of the Hagia Sophia, damage which took four to six years to repair, at least in the case of the Hagia Sophia itself. We're less informed about other parts of the city, but if the city walls cracked, for instance, it would be a good idea to have them repaired at once since you are on the cusp of engaging in a major prolonged conflict with an enemy who liked to take the offensive. It's possible that Basil's original plan was to take the field in the spring of 990, but possibly due to the problems posed by the earthquake, his campaign was actually delayed until the spring of 991. After he launched his campaign in 991, the hope was that he would campaign continuously and uninterruptedly until he brought about a complete victory over Bulgaria. Let's consider Basil's overall grand strategy for this campaign. His strategy was somewhat simple, but also 
quite logical. The plan was to campaign in the heart of Bulgaria, to winter there, and to reduce all of Samuel's strongholds. Surely, Samuel would then be forced into open battles that he could not win, and this would mean depriving Samuel of all of his strongholds while also smashing his armies, and therefore bringing the rebellion of the Bulgarians to its knees and forcing them to accept the rule of Byzantium. If you defeat Samuel enough times in the field, Basil seems to have reasoned that might just discredit him and make the Bulgarians think that their time as an independent power had passed. The assumption seems to have been that any open battles would necessarily favor Basil because he had more heavy troops. In general, the Byzantines tended to do better in open battles as opposed to more broken circumstances such as ambushes. And with the addition of the Varangian Guard, this meant that Basil was much more confident than normal in his ability to win open battles. In fact, after 989, when he always has the Varangian Guard with him, I'm not sure if he ever lost a battle again. But that was just the calculation. We'll see how that actually plays out. Basil decided to run the risk of leaving the East without a Domesticus of the East. A Domesticus, of course, was a sort of commander-in-chief who oversaw all of the various armies of the East. And the reason why Basil was willing to forego having a Domesticus is because he knew that there was a great danger that a Domesticus of the East might not be all that loyal, and this person might then take advantage of any failures on Basil's part to start a revolt. And then he would get the backing of the majority of the aristocracy, many of whom would work under the Domesticus more closely than under Basil. It was a calculated risk, and I think it actually was a logical one, given Basil standing with the aristocracy at this moment, the level of trust he could legitimately have after such a massive revolt on the part of Bardas Phokas, and also the fact that there was really no compelling reason to have a Domesticus. There were no threats on the eastern frontier. All of the powers that he bordered were either more or less passive towards him, or they were extremely weak. The one exception was the Fatimid Caliphate, which had been relatively passive for decades for the most part. The last attack from them had been in 983, and it had been kind of a one-off thing. Basil ended up being wrong because the Fatimid Caliph randomly decided that he wanted to conquer Syria, and especially the Emirate of Aleppo, so he became aggressive in the early 990s. But that was something that was pretty hard to predict, and it literally came out of the blue, even without Appointing a Domesticus, however, as we know from the last video, Basil was able to contain that threat. And while he did not want to take breaks from the Bulgarian War, once again, Basil's primary source of strength was in the east. So if there was a crisis there, he was willing to take his army on a rapid campaign to consolidate positions, undo damage, and set things right. But these campaigns were not to really extend the empire so much as to hold the line, because again, the goal was to conquer Bulgaria while keeping the East the way that it was. Our main source for the Byzantine-Bulgarian War is John Skylitsis, one of the best known Byzantine historians. At first, you might think that this means we're in good hands and that our knowledge of this conflict must be more or less precise. However, that unfortunately is not the case. Skylitsis is much more of a chronicler who has his own ideas about how organizations should work than he is a historian who enjoys using the narrative format or who follows strict chronology. Skylitsis has numerous entries on different battles, campaigns, and incidents from the war, including defections and other notable events. However, he organizes all of these things thematically, not chronologically. So for instance, all of the defections are listed back to back. And we know that not all the defections occurred back to back, say on one day or whatever. This was something which took place over a long period of time and different people were in a position to defect at different times. Say if they were a garrison commander somewhere and they were isolated with no hope of relief in 998 or whatever year it might be. So, um, our knowledge of precise chronology is not very good. In fact, although 
the picture that we have of the east is drawn from about three or four different sources and they all have a very local flavor to them by combining those sources we actually have a much more comprehensive view of basil's eastern campaigns about the same time than we do of his campaigns against the bulgarians so tracing the movements of basil or samuel or any given general is very difficult and we're not even entirely sure when a given city or territory is in Byzantine or Bulgarian hands. A lot of times that is not recorded precisely when something changes hands. And for this reason, I have chosen to follow what Caldellus thinks about the course of events. Caldellus has spent years studying this. He knows the sources for this a lot better than I ever will. So I am deferring to his judgment when it comes to chronology. A large part of the reason why I chose to divide the Bulgarian War into two parts is because each half of the conflict, as divided at around the year 1003 or so, has a different dynamic. The first half of the war is characterized by lots and lots of fluidity. Both sides effectively are on the offensive and the defense at the same time, and cities and territories change hands rather regularly. Now, as I mentioned earlier, due to Skylitzes, we don't have a precise knowledge of who held what when, but we do know that at various times, someone would capture a city, and then later on, without any notice about the city being retaken, we know that it must have been retaken prior to this because someone will retreat there or winter there or do something else there that they shouldn't be able to do if the other side still held it. So the picture that we have of the conflict is a little fuzzy, but it is clear that there's a lot of fluidity. The borders that we see on a map between Byzantium and Bulgaria did not necessarily limit or define the arena of action. Samuel will penetrate as far as central Greece at one point, and Basil will be deep in Bulgarian territory on many, many occasions. And at some points, Samuel will campaign on Byzantine core territory, hope, probably trying to draw Basil out of Bulgaria. So while Basil is deep in Bulgarian territory, sometimes Samuel will be on the offensive in Imperial territory. And so far as we can tell, these events were simultaneous. There's also a basic pattern to how things play out. Because Basil has the strongest army with him and the Varangian Guard, he pretty much always won the operations that he was conducting. We'll see that there are a couple times where some of the sieges don't quite go to what he wanted, but for the most part, if he's there, he's taking stuff. Later on, Samuel will sweep through the area and retake some things by defeating Basil's subordinates or garrisons. And this seems to be the basic pattern of this phase of the war, Although it is worth noting that the overall tenor of the conflict is that the Byzantines are gaining much more than they're losing. While we don't really have a lot of details about most of the battles from this period, especially the battles that Basil himself conducted, there's no indication that Basil's personal forces were anything other than victorious, with the exception, as I mentioned earlier, of a couple of sieges where they were unable to take a city. But in any kind of field battle fought during this period, Basil's men were invariably victorious, at least when we have both a notification of a battle taking place and of its outcome. Most likely, this is due to Basil's new Varangian guard. This 6,000 strong Tagma owed all of its loyalty to the emperor and accompanied him at all times. Unlike the regular army, it was not raised by the Anatolian aristocracy, and it had no loyalties to anyone except Basil personally. For Basil, this was probably the strongest selling point, especially in the years following Phocas's revolt. Also, keep in mind that 6,000 men in this period was basically a small army. So anytime Basil added his Varangian guard to an existing army, that is a substantial reinforcement. And most likely he was adding more than that whenever he was present in person. And since the Varangians were both numerous and good, this meant that adding them to any army meant that it was now favored in pretty much any field battle that Basil might 
presumably fight against the Bulgarians or any of his other foes. The Varangians alone, I would argue, are enough to even the odds. So this is part of why Basil will never again be humiliated like he was at Trajan's Gate. He has 6,000 men who are personally loyal to him and both willing and able to smash the enemy line as it is presented to them. When Basil's campaign began in the spring of 991, his first priority was to liberate all of the cities in his own territory, which Samuel had garrisoned with Bulgarians. These garrisons proved to be a little more than speed bumps, and by the end of 991, Basil had expelled all of the Bulgarians, or at least most of them, from Macedonia and Thessaly. His primary achievement in 991 was the recapture of the city of Veroea. Its fall had been a major embarrassment to him a few years earlier, so its recapture was quite a big deal. After the recapture of Beroea, he then marches deep into the heart of Bulgaria, and it was his intention to campaign here while his subordinates held down the fort back in the home territory until he emerged fully victorious. However, as we know, this did not quite come to pass. Partly this was due to setbacks in Syria, which required his attention that we talked about last time, and also just that Samuel and the Bulgarians proved to be a great deal more resilient than perhaps Basil had anticipated. By the summer of 992 at the latest, Basil was deep into Bulgaria proper, and at this time he entrusted Gregorios Terranides, the son of Asat III of Terran, who had surrendered his realm to the Byzantines, I believe during the time of Nicephorus Phocas, he had left this general of Armenian extraction in charge of imperial forces stationed at Thessalonica, while he himself took the Varangian Guard and the field army deep into the heart of Bulgaria to try to capture the major centers. This was, Basil hoped, going to be the decisive act. Once he arrived in Bulgaria in 992, Basil stayed until 995, wreaking quite a bit of havoc and making some significant progress. At some point during this period, remember we don't have a precise chronology, he was able to win a major battle against Samuel at the Axios River. He was able to capture the city of Orid in what is now actually southwestern Macedonia, but at the time was considered to be part of the Bulgarian realm. He besieged the city of Pernik, and while he came close to capturing it, he didn't quite capture it. The ruins at Pernik are on your screen. There's also a modern city of Pernik, but these are more of the medieval uh, fortress ruins. Basil successfully captured the city of Skopje, and when he took the city, he also took the eunuch Tsar Roman as captive. Tsar Roman was something of a cipher for Samuel at the time. Samuel was not the Tsar himself, but he basically exercised power, and then Roman was the sort of token ruler as the son of the last legitimate Tsar. So Roman had a lot of symbolic value. Basil then took him back to Byzantium, gave him some court titles, and appointed him governor of Abydus on the Asian side of the Hellespont. And as we'll see, Roman didn't live all that much longer, and although he was fairly nominal in terms of his importance, his death would end up having an impact politically and on the course of this conflict. After Basil led his army into Bulgaria, Samuel seems to have decided that it was not wise to focus all of his efforts on defense. The defeat that he suffered at the Axios River probably helped to confirm this conclusion. So what he did is he divided his efforts into defending his homeland and backing up his garrisons, and then trying to attack what I consider to be core imperial holdings, i.e. the provinces of Macedon and Thessaly, to hit Basil where it hurts, to try to draw Basil out of Bulgarian lands. Samuel's contention was that if you can hurt us, we can hurt you too. Our empire deserves to exist. Our citizens deserve to be left in peace. Basil, of course, was not the most sentimental man in the world, and his subjects would endure some suffering at the hands of Bulgarian raiders, but not nearly so much as the Bulgarians would suffer at the hands of Basil's armies. 
especially if the Varangian Guard got loose. Basil, due to the very strength of his army, remained safe in Bulgaria despite being so many miles behind enemy lines. The same cannot quite be said for his subordinates, who were commanding armies which were significantly weaker. Prior to the fall of 995, Samuel was able to win some notable victories against Basil's subordinates. Once again, we don't know the precise chronology, but we know that these things took place before about September of 995. In at least two separate ambushes, Samuel was able to capture Terenides' son, Esodios, and then later, when Terenides was trying to rescue his son, Samuel launched a second successful ambush where he killed Terenides himself. This meant that Basil had to appoint a new Dukes of Thessalonica, so he turned to Ioannis Chaldos. Chaldos replaced Terenides, but then in 996, he too fell victim to an ambush, and then he was held as a captive by Samuel for the next 22 years. Literally, Chaldos did not see the light of day again until Samuel's sons finally surrendered and any prospect of an independent Bulgaria died for the time being. So Chaldos is a real tragic figure here because he basically entered the scene maybe around 994 or 5, served for a year or two, and then spent the next 22 years being hustled around from prison to prison. As we know, the situation was fluid, so Samuel is hustling him from holding cell to holding cell all over the Balkans, and he has no control over his own destiny. It's kind of crazy to think about the tragedy of Chaldos. If you will recall from last time, when Chaldos was captured in 996, Basil was still in Syria campaigning and trying to make up for Bortzis' failure against the Fatimids. This meant that he could not speedily arrive himself to rescue the situation, so he sent a trusted general, Nicephorus Uranus, to take command at Thessalonica. By this time, or possibly a little later, Uranus had earned Basil's trust, and a little later he will become the first man that Basil granted the title of Domesticus, although Uranus's title of Domesticus actually applied to the West rather than the East. Perhaps the idea was that even though having a commander-in-chief could be potentially dangerous, since most of the great estates and the great families were located in Anatolia and Cappadocia, that having a well-placed Domesticus in the West would not be as dangerous since there were fewer local grandees trying to work him over. At any rate, Uranus would prove to be a great asset for Basil on many fronts. Following up the victories that he had won over Terenides and Shaldos, however, Samuel was determined to follow up his victories and to take advantage of Basil's absence. Therefore, he decided to embark on a deep raid into the heart of Greece to really bring the pain home to Byzantium's core territories and show Basil that his ways were full of folly and that he would never break the Bulgarian spirit. Uranus, however, was not so convinced that Samuel was going to break the Byzantine spirit as he hotly pursued Samuel down into Greece. We don't know how big of an army Uranus had, but presumably it was inferior in numbers to the army commanded by Samuel since Uranus's two predecessors had both suffered defeats at Samuel's hands. That being said, it could not have been vastly inferior, and perhaps Samuel was just overconfident. If we think about all of this from Samuel's perspective, he has defeated two consecutive duques at Thessalonica, and with the exception of Basil, with whom he has gone one and one, we don't really have a lot of evidence of Samuel losing battles against Byzantine generals. His raid has been going well so far, and now he has gotten himself and his army across the river Spurtius in central Greece, and he has some separation from Uranus's pursuing army. The river was swollen, so Samuel felt that his men were secure, and so he didn't really take all the precautions he should have in terms of looking for and defending fords, 
and making sure that the proper watch was posted at the camp. He really underestimated Urena, who so I guess to be fair at this point was a relatively unknown quantity. The result was a major and important battle, one of the most important battles, if not the most important battle of the first phase of the Bulgarian War, where ironically, Basil II himself was not within 1,500 miles of the battlefield. Uranus was not deterred by the swollen state of the river, and in fact, the Spurtius River is not exactly the mighty Mississippi, so even when it's swollen, it is hardly some insuperable barrier. Uranus found a ford, crossed it, and then launched a bold night attack on the Bulgarian camp. Night attacks are always extremely risky, so Uranus here displayed some real balls of steel by going through with the attack. He gained an overwhelming victory. He captured 12,000 men, killed another thousand, and then sent the 12,000 prisoners and 1,000 severed heads to Constantinople. This was a disaster on scale with the later and much better known disaster at Clidian. Samuel and his son were so thoroughly defeated that supposedly the only way that they were able to escape was by hiding themselves among the dead. Apparently, Uranus did not behead all of the dead, otherwise this plan would not have worked. And then they had to escape in disguise through Western Greece, traveling probably as shepherds or whatever, until they reached the city of Orid, which the Bulgarians had presumably retaken at some point. This led to a fundamental revision of Samuel's strategy, and it was one of the major turning points in the war. Remember, Pacellus said that Basil commanded all of his battles in person, and that he rarely trusted anyone with major tasks. But here we see Uranus being entrusted with an important task, and coming through in a big way, turning the tide of the war while Basil was 1,500 miles away. The Battle of the Spurtius seems to have temporarily broken Samuel's spirit, as much as it broke his material power. After the battle, he sued for peace, and Basil, for his part, was open to the possibility. Getting Samuel to surrender would effectively end the whole war. Without Samuel, there really was no key leader for the Bulgarians to rally around. It would appear that Samuel thought Basil held all the cards, and that one of the key cards was the Tsar Roman. However, in early 997, Roman suddenly died, and this caused Samuel to change his mind. He now saw an opening, a way for himself to gain leverage and to revitalize his prestige among the Bulgarians. As soon as he heard that Roman was dead, Samuel broke off the negotiations with Basil and declared himself Tsar. Furious, Basil ordered his general Uranus to retaliate against this new so-called czar. Um, the reason why Basil would not regard him as legitimate is because in Zemiskis' time, he had officially retired the Bulgarian crown jewels and dedicated them at the Hagia Sophia or one of the other churches. So according to Byzantine accounts, and I guess what you might call Byzantine law even, the empire of Bulgaria had been officially retired and absorbed. So technically Samuel was acting as a usurper, at least from Basil's perspective. So Uranus went to Bulgaria and laid waste for a few months. Samuel still had no real army, so he couldn't fight back. And then Uranus went home. The Battle of the Spurtius was far from the end of the war with the Bulgarians, which would go on until 1018. But it would be the last time that Samuel's forces would penetrate deep into Byzantine territory. This would be the last time that they really had any offensive ambitions or that they had any strategy of, we will bring the hurt to you so you will stop bringing it to us. For the next several years at least, at least until about 1003, Samuel and his followers will pursue a strategy which seems to have been almost entirely defensive in nature. Following the breakdown of talks between Basil and Samuel, we don't really know exactly how the war went for the next six or seven years. However, we do have a pretty good idea of the general outline and course of the war. Basil would have returned to the front as soon as possible, 
and he would have stayed as long as possible until he was called away to deal with a new crisis in Syria. That crisis also necessitated that Basil call Nicephorus Uranus to take command in Antioch so that the East would remain secure. At that point, he knew he needed someone he could trust who was capable, and with Dalasinos dead, he had to turn to Nicephorus Uranus. So he will exit from the Bulgarian conflict at that time, and so far as I'm aware, he would not return to it. According to Anthony Caldellus, he thinks that many of the numerous high-level Bulgarian defections recorded in Skylitsis occurred during this period, when Bulgarian fortunes were at one of their lower ebbs. When a Bulgarian nobleman would defect to Byzantium, Basil would reward that man with titles and commands, always located far from the Bulgarian border, of course, since you would not want someone who might revert to their formal loyalty, say if Samuel marched nearby and waved the flag in the wind. So for instance, if you defected to Byzantium, you might get a position somewhere in Asia, somewhere where you could serve the empire without possibly rousing the loyalty of other Bulgarians and rising up in revolt to help Samuel. One of the more prominent defectors of this particular period, at least according to Caldellus, was a man named Dobromir, who later became known as Damianos to the Byzantines. Of course, it goes without saying he is not to be confused with Damianos Dalasinos, who was a native aristocrat. As we wrap up this video, I would like to consider the state of the war in 1003, when Bulgarian fortunes are at a very low ebb. As I said earlier, we don't really know the precise sequence of events between 997 and 1003, but it is very clear that the course of the action was entirely in favor of Basil and his generals. In fact, the Bulgarian war-obsessed monarch Basil felt so confident that he actually allowed operations to be managed by minor officials while both he and the talented, trustworthy Nicephorus Uranus were either in the east or in transit between the two halves of the empire. This took place around 999 or 1000, and I have to wonder if Basil and Uranus had been present in Europe at this time, if the war could have just been wrapped up about that time, two decades early, and how this might have changed the course of history. Of course, this didn't end up happening. Samuel was stuck on defense throughout this time, and things were going awry. In 999, the proven and capable Uranus was replaced by the otherwise unknown David Arianides as dukes at Thessalonica. In 1000, or perhaps 1001, a naval attack in the eastern Bulgaria, led by two imperial generals, hit the cities of Pliska, Preslov, and the Danube, of course, Skylitsis doesn't tell us whether this was a raid or a conquest, and while we're on the subject, it's worth noting that when Zemiskis conquered and garrisoned Bulgaria, he mostly focused on the eastern cities, so it's possible that these centers had held on for a very long time indeed. Uh, so again, it'd be kind of cool to know whether this was just an attempt to hang on to cities that were under threat at the time, or whether this was a reconquest or what exactly was going on. Most likely it was some sort of reconquest since, as we'll see, Samuel was in very dire straits by 1003. In 1002 to 3, somewhere in that period, Basil embarked on an eighth month siege of the city of Vidin. This is sort of on the northwest extremity of the Bulgarian Empire, and he managed to capture the city. This shows you just how badly things had gone. This was deep in the heart of Bulgaria at a place that the Byzantines had no business reaching. This would be the equivalent of Samuel breaking past the Byzantine forces on the frontier and capturing Athens or Mystra or somewhere deep in Greece that he had no business ever getting near. For his part, Samuel decided to temporarily revert to his old strategy of bringing the pain to imperial territories, and he struck into the territory not far from the capital. He attacked Adrianople during a fair on August 15th, 1003, 
but he didn't capture the city, which was probably what he was hoping for. He may have indeed inflicted some suffering on some local peasants, but aside from alarming people and gaining an entry with an actual date in Skylitzes, Samuel's attack was not altogether successful. Samuel was, by this point, however, quite aware that his defensive strategy was not working and that he needed to take the fight to the Byzantines in some way if he wanted to avoid the dust bend of history for a little while longer. Accordingly, now that he was limited to just the region around the city of Orid, he decided to embark on a radically different strategy, one which we'll cover in part four when the Bulgarian War continues and then reaches its ultimate climax at a little known battle called Clidian. Until then, I'm Thersites the Historian. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell, and all of that fun stuff. Peace out.